Hello and welcome to the 2021 Hardy Grant Children's Publishing Retailer Roadshow. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land on which we work, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Hardy Grant recognises their unbroken connection to land, water and culture and pays respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Thank you, our wonderful booksellers, for your support and dedication to through what was a very challenging 2020. Um, we could all stop and dwell on what happened, um, but really, let's look at the positives. 2020 delivered a year where people returned to books. Um, 2020 proved that families had more time to be together, to enjoy each other and to share stories. And it actually put storytelling at the centre of what we, what we are as a society. It's very humbling to be part of um, making stories for children and making stories for families. Um, and it's very humbling to be part of a very dedicated team here at Hardy Grant Children's Publishing. 2020 also delivered change. It changed our processes and it changed where we work. In case you missed it, um, our name changed to Hardy Grant Children's Publishing. It's a, a, a moment where we've emerged um, to do what we do best, producing market-leading fiction and the best illustrated picture books. Through everything that was 2020, the very dedicated Hardy Grant Children's Publishing team, including our very talented authors and illustrated, illustrators, showed strength in character and an enormous amount of resilience to deliver what we're about to show you um, our best program ever. During the next 60 minutes, our team is going to share with you a glimpse of our upcoming program, while throughout the year, our very dedicated um, Hardy Grant sales team will show you our full program. What we have in store for you, I am sure you'll have no doubt, is the finest children's publishing coming from any Australian New Zealand publisher including beautiful and topical picture books from our favourites, Nick Bland, Philip Bunting, Thomas Mayer, Sally Rippon. Timely market responsiveness and extensions to the wonderful Welcome To series with Yumi and Dr Melissa Kang delivering two new books, Welcome To Consent and Welcome To Your Boobs. New fiction that will lead the pack, watch out for underdogs and Barclay Mansion. New YA, Tim Tamaro and the Subterranean Heartsick Blues. A great debut novel, winner of the Ampersand Prize, and language where young YA readers will love, very topical, and there are some scenes that will simply just make you blush. And new titles from our favourites, Claris, Tim Flannery, Sean McAuliffe, and much, much more. Thank you wonderful booksellers for your support and dedication through what was a very challenging 2020. Hello booksellers, I'm Kate Brown, I am the Commercial Director at Hardy Grant Children's Publishing and I'm here to introduce our brand sparkly new imprint, Bright Light. Bright Light is an imprint that publishes books that aim to shine a light on tricky conversations that are happening around the country. It is an exuberant, groundbreaking list of books and you would have already seen some come from this clever team. We published Daybreak in January this year and Our Home, Our Heartbeat last year, um, as well as Girls Are Pretty and Boys Will Be um, and plenty more to come in 2021. The publishing team at Bright Light published books under six pillars, gender, environment, bodies, First Nations, character and diversity. You can expect to see books on all of these six topics in the 2021 list. I'll now hand you over to Ali O'Brien, who's our associate publisher at Bright Light, who will take you through some of the exciting books to come in 2021. So The Boy Who Tried to Shrink His Name is a story about a little boy called Zimdalamash Kamishkada who uh, is starting a new school and knows that he needs to do something about his really long name. So he tries to shrink it in the dryer and fold it down like origami and um, you know various other things but it pops back up and always returns to its original size and embarrasses him. And it's not until 
until he forms a friendship with a girl in his class that he can really embrace who he is and uh, step confidently into his name. So The Boy Who Tried to Shrink His Name is an own voices story by Sandhya Parapukaran and Michelle Pereira, two Australian creatives. It's their first picture book. It's really exciting to pair them together on a story that really resonates with them and, and means so much to them. So The Boy Who Tried to Shrink His Name really speaks to that conversation about how important it is to say people's names properly and, you know, you might not get it right the first time, but it's about um, doing the right thing and putting the effort in and um, asking questions and just being decent. It's, it's also a really universal story in that um, Zim, you know, really sort of tries to make, tries to shrink himself in, in order to fit in. So it's, it's a feeling that will really resonate with a lot of people, even people who don't have really long, um, hard to pronounce names. And so now we're going to hear from Sandhya to talk about her story. Hi, I'm Sandhya Parbogaran. I'm a children's author based in Brisbane. Uh, originally, I'm from Kerala in India. The Boy Who Tried to Shrink His Name was inspired by my experience with my own long name. I was always reluctant to correct people and would let them say it however they wanted. Then one day, a colleague showed genuine interest in learning how to say my name correctly. I was touched by her thoughtfulness and the fact that she has pronounced my name correctly ever since. When someone wants to learn a little bit more about you, it creates a moment of connectedness that makes you feel valued. A kind gesture like that empowers you to express yourself and reminds you that you don't have to hide away or shrink your differences. And that is a wonderful and liberating feeling. In my story, The Boy Who Tried to Shrink His Name, the main character faces a similar situation and when he makes a friend, they both teach each other something valuable. In August, we have Freedom Day Publishing, which is a really special release for us. It is going to lead our First Nations publishing this year. Um, it is written by Thomas Mayer and Rosie Smiler, and it is the story of the Wave Hill Walk-Off. So a lot of uh, Australians, I think, know about the Wave Hill Walk-Off sort of um, more generally, and uh, they definitely know the name Vincent Lingari, especially because of um, Paul Kelly's song. But I think that not that many people, um, well, not enough people, people know about the events that led to the Wave Hill walk-off and um, Vincent Langari's role in that and just how um, the enormity of it and it's just such a, a monumental event um, in Australian history and something we should all know about and um, we should all know about Vincent and recognise his face and he should be a real a symbol for, for this country and so hopefully this book is going to be the first step in, in making that happy happen and um, yeah for his for his face and name and his story and the story of the Gurunji people to just be um, a household story and something that every Australian knows. So uh, the force behind Freedom Day is Thomas Mayer, who you all know from Finding the Heart of the Nation and um, Finding Our Heart, the children's edition. And Thomas worked really closely with Vincent Lingari's granddaughter on this story. So he travelled to Kalkarinji and met with the Lingari family and um, really worked the text and is continuing to work um, with the elders and the Lingari family on the storyboard. Um, so we're in such a special position to be taking this story direct from the Lingari family and um, making it into something that can be shared with, with everyone in Australia. My name's Thomas Mayer. My name's Rosa Smala. And we're the authors of Freedom Day. And we're looking forward to sharing this story about the Wave Hill walk-off, Vincent Lingari's dream to um, move away from basically what was slavery and fight for their rights, their land rights and equal pay. Um, it's an incredible story. Rosie, 
Um, yeah, on behalf of my grandfather, I just want to like share the story and even though about the books, book now that um, we I started doing with Thomas, um, what my grandfather did and to his people, it inspired all of us, me and all of the kids back at home and even though um, the union mob as well, yeah, what the Kodinji mob did, you know. Yeah, it's going to be a beautiful book. Um, I hope that uh, I hope that you guys get behind it and uh, it sells lots of copies and spreads the story of the the wonderful bravery and courage of the Gurindji people and Vincent Lingari. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anna Beavis, children's publisher at Heidi Grant Children's Books. Kate and Joel Temple are internationally award-winning authors of over 15 books for kids. From hits like Rumana Rock and Bin Chicken, these guys really know how to make kids laugh. But things are about to get even funnier with their new detective series for ages seven plus, The Underdogs. Let's put them under the spotlight and find out what it's all about. Hi, I'm Kate Temple, but you may know me as Kate Temple. And I'm Joel Temple, but I'm not giving you another word until I speak to my lawyer. It's okay, Joel. This is a publicity video. Oh, well, hello then. Okay, a publicity video. We are the authors of a brand new detective series for kids called The Underdogs. It's set around a ragtag team of dog detectives who solve cases in Dogtown. It's about dogs and, and a cat. And a cat. Wait, a cat? I thought you said they were called The Underdogs. Yeah, well, they are, but in a town that's gone to the dogs, you're going to need yourself a cat. The underdogs are down on their luck, but that's not going to stop them from solving the biggest mystery around. In book one, Catch a Cat Burglar, the underdogs are hot on the tail of Dogtown's infamous cat burglar. And when there's a cat burglar in town, you need to think like a cat. So our two leads, Fang and Barkley, they're your classic mismatched buddies. Think Starsky and Hutch. In fact, we got a lot of inspiration from classic uh, old detective shows like Starsky and Hutch, and Magnum P.I., Miami Vice. Oh, and Ghostbusters. And Ghostbusters. Just check out the glorious 80s inspired neon cover on that puppy. Wow. This book is full of great characters. There's Fan. She's a young street cat. She's bright, she's brave, and she's totally inexperienced. Did I mention she only has one eye? And three teeth. Then there's her partner Barkley, a by-the-book German shepherd who's down on his luck. But he just needs one good case to turn things around. Then there's Dr. Spots, a Dalmatian of course. She's the brains and spots of this operation. If only she could get one of her inventions to work. And then of course Carl, the Hawaiian shirt-wearing chihuahua who's meant to answer the phones. Hello, Underdogs Detective Agency, no clue left on Doug. Uh, sorry, wrong number. Okay, alright, yeah, that's cool. Bye. 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 All these characters have been brought to life so brilliantly by Brisbane-based illustrator Shiloh Gordon. Even though we're in different states, we've loved working side by side together, coming up with ideas and so many dog puns. If you're looking for something to recommend to a kid who loves the bad guys and real pigeons, then this is the book for them. It's highly illustrated and designed to move the reader along. It's a good solid length too, about 8,000 words. So they're getting a lot of reading done, a lot of laughing done, and this is the perfect book for an early reader looking to get into chapter books. We actually think it's the perfect book for early readers. That's terrible, Joel. Woof. From beloved children's author Sally Rippon and illustrator Chris Kennett, we are thrilled to be debuting a brand new series for early readers called School of Monsters. Here to tell you all about it is Sally Rippon and Chris Kennett. Hello, it's Sally Rippon here. Just wanting to give a huge thanks to all the booksellers across the country for all your support for School of Monsters. I'm so excited to have another series in the world and I'm really excited to talk to you a little bit more about the ideas behind these books. I just wanted to introduce you to the ideas behind the series. So a lot of thought went into creating this and I guess we're thinking of the way that they can be used uh, comes under the headings of uh, read aloud, read along and read alone. So read aloud 
in that uh, first of all you a parent or a carer an adult will sit with the child and read the whole story out to them so it's simple it's rhyming it's silly there's lots going on in the pictures to engage the child and that is really just the first and most important activity that kids have that experience of hearing something read aloud then kids may be brave enough to try sounding out some words for themselves so they may have started to receive a little bit of reading uh, teaching at school so they may have um, learnt some of these words or some of the sounds like pet and yet uh, some of the simpler ones in here Ted and Fet and so then the process will be that an adult will read part of the sentence to the child and then they can read those big words in bold themselves and of course eventually the most exciting part is when the child wants to run away with the book and have a go at reading the whole thing for themselves so we've thought about how the best way we can entice kids to want to read is to create great stories and great characters but I've also worked very hard to use the simplest vocabulary possible so that they can build up the confidence to read the books for themselves. When it came to having the books illustrated, this was the most fun part. I mean, it really is the best part of working in a collaborative team. So I was working with my publisher, the wonderful Marissa Pintado, and uh, we were lucky enough to have Chris Kennett come on board quite early on. And so the whole process of putting the books together was very much a collaboration. It was a lovely thing to be doing during lockdown. And I had an idea of what I hoped the illustrations would be like, but I have to say in all honesty, they're even better than I could have imagined. So Chris's background is in animation and it was quite important to me that the look of the characters could almost look like something that children might see in an animation or potentially in a movie and this is because so many kids across the country but I would say across the world are very familiar with stories that are told on screen so they've got Monsters Inc, they've got Hotel Transylvania, Adam's Family, all of those kind of stories but always as a children's author I'm trying to bring them back to books and so if I, I wanted a style that could look familiar to them, um, accessible, potentially like something that they're um, that they've seen on television I guess is really what I'm trying to say but bring them back to the book bring them back to understanding that once you unlock reading that you can have all those stories come to yourself you don't just have to sit and absorb them passively through a screen which is a you know it's a really big leap so Chris has just created this incredible world and oh my goodness I cannot tell you how thrilled I am with them I mean even just starting with the incredible school that he's drawn on all the pages here you'll see that there's a lot of repetition because I think kids like that idea of familiarity they know how each book is going to to start but you can find this little wormy guy on every page this goggly eyed guy moves across and the bats are different on every page too so all these lovely little things for kids to look out for plus all the movement all the fun um, all the action comes across in his illustrations and the characters are just so lovable so it really was an amazing experience having the chance to work with Chris and he really has just taken this world and built it and really brought just brought it to life in a way that I cannot be more grateful for I love the look of them I hope that your the children that come into your bookstores will be as attracted to them as I am hello my name is Chris Kennett and I am the illustrator of the School of Monsters. So when I first started out designing the monsters for these books, I wanted to make them as cute as possible because these are books for, for younger readers. So having monsters that are too scary um, is going to be a little bit off-putting. We want to encourage them to read. We don't want to scare them away from reading. So that was that was quite important. Also, I wanted to make them quite simple in shape. I wanted to make them uh, sort of distinct and um, recognizable from each other. And uh, so I have clear silhouettes. And um, so the different shapes and different sizes, um, which could easily be identifiable and recognizable as for each character. And then from there, um, they all have their own distinct color as well, um, which is also quite important in, in being able to recognize um, what character is what and who and who is who uh, in the stories because sometimes the characters um, join in with each other's stories so they might be um, 
sort of lurking in the background. And uh, so if they're easily recognizable by shape and by color, um, you know, that's, that's really important just for the visual storytelling. I was really pleased that we got to include a how to draw segment in these books. Um, often there's not, there's not enough room or, or space to be able to, to do something like this. Um, but this just adds another level of interactivity into the stories, which I, which I really appreciate. And one of the things I wanted to really focus on when designing the characters was to make them easy to replicate. And I know that on the surface, they can look a little bit more complicated, but what I like to do in the how to draw sections is to actually really boil them down to their really base shapes and use really simple instructions and hopefully the kids can follow along with those. Coming in September, we are also thrilled to announce that Sally Rippin's very first picture book, Big Dog, Little Dog, will be debuting on the Hardy Grant Children's Publishing list, all about blended families and the love that we find together. I'm super excited to have a picture book coming out a little bit later this year. It's called Big Dog, Little Dog, and I guess it's about how we adjust when our family changes. So it could be the arrival of a younger sibling, it could be the arrival of step siblings and just the little bit of feeling of being left out or things have to change to accommodate the new person in the home. I put all those feelings and those emotions into the story of Big Dog Little Dog. So hopefully there'll be things in there that children recognise but also lots of fun for them to see in the silly dogs themselves. It's such a joy to have somebody illustrate a picture book text. In fact, this is the first time I've experienced this normally, particularly in the first, I guess, 10 or 15 years when I was first published, I was illustrating books for other people. So this is the first time I've had someone illustrate for me. So it was such a thrill to be teamed up with Lucinda Gifford. She's done an extraordinary job. I guess when I was writing Big Dog, Little Dog in mind, I had stories like Harry the Dirty Dog and the 101 Dalmatians, um, not just the lives of the dogs, but also the lives of the family around them in my mind. And what Lucinda's done is she's kind of taken that retro feel, but brought it into a really contemporary setting. The colors are gorgeous, the characters are fantastic. And then somehow she's taken a very, very simple text and just given it this beautiful layer of heart and emotion. And I couldn't be more thrilled with the work. I absolutely love the look of Big Dog, Little Dog and I hope all your kids will too. Hi, I'm Anna Beavis, publisher. We have an exciting new book by Philip Bunting, all about microbes, coming out in June. And it is as funny and informative as at all of his other books that we've done. It also has beautiful um, embossed cover. Um, and then in October, we have Superpower, all about renewable energy. Me, Microbes and I by Philip Bunting. Microbes are living things and almost living things. So small that we can only see them with the help of a microscope. You could fit thousands of them in the full stop at the end of this sentence. This screen is covered in microbes. What? You are covered in microbes. Ew! They're in the air, in the water, at the park, in your dessert, in the desert, in the Arctic, in the attic, on your skin. Gross! It's not gross. Well, I guess it's a bit gross. Right at this moment, there are probably thousands of bacteria at the end of your finger, depending on where it's been. Remember, they are so small, you can't see them without a microscope. Microbes are so tiny that we estimate that all of the world's microbes would weigh 50 times more than all of the world's animals. No! That's bonkers! And they only live for about 12 hours. With only 12 hours to get things done, they tend not to waste too much time. So on YouTube or video games? Not so much. All right, let's take a mosey on over and meet a few of these weenie weirdies that have been causing trouble lately. Viruses. Viruses are weird. They're considered the borderline between life they can't reproduce or even move by themselves. They rely on hijacking a living host cell in order to reproduce. Let's meet some. Oh, cute! Not cute. This is the coronavirus. 
If you've ever had a cold, then you've had a virus take over some of your cells, probably a rhinovirus. Viruses are so diverse that they can infect the cells of almost any living thing. Most viruses can't survive outside a host cell for very long. They depend on a swift transition from host to host in order to survive. A few of their favourite modes of transportation include sneezes, touch and mozzies. Uh Uh-huh. Wash your hands, sneeze in your elbow. That's right. So, what's the snotty trail of the common cold? You, me, your mum and possibly the cat. We've all had one. The thing that we call the common cold can be caused by any one of around 200 pesky viruses. Here's how it works. There are only three ways in which a cold virus will typically get into your body. Through your mouth, through your nose, or in through the mucous membranes around your eyes. Once that nasty virus is inside your body, it will quickly move from cell to cell until it enters your bloodstream, your lungs, and starts to make you feel rotten. This is where I start feeling a bit sorry for myself. One of the first symptoms you'll notice is a runny nose. Your immune system creates more mucus to help defend against the virus. Sneezing is an effective means of transportation for viruses. When you sneeze, the little blighters fly out of your face at 300 kilometres per hour and can travel up to 4 metres. That's a very intense way you can spread this virus. If the virus is replicating in your throat, that area will probably become sore. This soreness is due to the cells in your throat rupturing as the virus spreads. This doesn't sound fun. Yep, this is about the time you might start losing your sense of humour. You might also get a cough. Every time you cough, you launch infectious particles of saliva and mucus containing millions of viral microbes into the air, helping the virus find new hosts. Cough in your elbow. Exactly. And stay home. Keep those microbes to yourself. And wash your hands. Of course. Do you know how to do that? Of course. So, wash your palms, back of hands, thumbs, scrub your nails, wash your wrists, rinse and dry. You're amazing. Tune in for the next episode. Your immune system. It's marvellous. And the vaccine. So clever. Bacteria and protozoa and fungi. Oh my. And if you want to become an expert, an armchair epidemiologist, pick up a copy of Me, Microbes and I in store June 2021 and available for pre-order now. One of our biggest titles in June this year is Welcome to Consent. As we've seen in the media landscape over the past few weeks, consent is a topic that is becoming increasingly relevant and we need to be having these conversations with kids earlier than we ever thought we needed to. Dr. Melissa Kang and Uni Steins have been writing this book for the past two years and we're now incredibly honoured and privileged to be having these conversations with them leading the charge. Here to discuss more about consent and who needs to be talking about it is Dr. Melissa Kang and Yumi Steins. Hi, it's Yumi and Dr. Melissa Kang here, authors of Welcome to Consent. We're so proud of this book, which we started writing probably more than two years ago. It was about two years. It's a very long time. Um, Dr. Melissa and I are both parents. We coincidentally have the same kind of layout of children, three girls and one boy. And um, I think we felt a real sense of urgency around writing this book. So Welcome to Your Period had been a really huge success. And we were like, well, what's next? And it was very much about sort of weighing up what deserved the most oxygen with the most immediate need and consent was it. So I wrote for the magazine Dolly, I wrote for Dolly Doctor for 23 years. I also practice as a doctor with young people here in Sydney and even though the word consent doesn't come up a lot in their questions, it's implied in just about every interaction they have of an intimate nature and that's why I felt there was really an urgency to get some of these ideas into the book and you know Yumi and I have collaborated so so well with Welcome to Your Period and this was a really tricky topic to write about but just like period I feel like we struck a really good balance and um, really addressed a lot of the 
issues that I have seen over the years of, of working with young people. You know, when it comes to talking about consent, we tend to think of, oh my God, you know, they're teenagers now, they've got all their puberty hormones happening, we better start talking to them about the S word and consent. In fact, in my experience, not only as a parent, but also as a health professional, it's actually really important to talk about consent from the very beginning. Wouldn't you say so, Yumi? Definitely. <laughs> Little things like tickling yep. um, is a really good example because it's touch, it's intimate. It can be fun, but can, it can also tip over into the point where you would like to withdraw consent. So there's a lot of great examples that we can talk you through in the book that are age appropriate. One of the questions Dr. Melissa and I get asked a lot about Welcome to Consent is how old does my child need to be to read your book? Um, there's no real answer. I think it depends on the maturity of your child, but if we had to put a number on it, I'd say from eight upwards. Yeah, I think certainly the, the early part of the book, the first two thirds of it is very suitable for a child as young as eight and it introduces ideas around communication, how to say yes and no, how to know what you feel you want and how to communicate that. It talks about the idea of bodily autonomy and what that means and that's something that's relevant to everybody. What we really hope to get from this book is for all school children to have a copy. It's just such a great kind of introduction into the basic concepts of consent. And when you think about consent and its teaching, you often think, oh, how to teach a girl how to protect herself. But there's so much more to it than that. There's also about how to respect other people's bodily autonomy and how to communicate around those boundaries. So you might be a horny boy who wants to kiss his partner. How do you ask for that in a respectful way? And how do you hear when somebody says no? We cover all of those things in the book. Each of us spoke to several young adolescents as well as young adults and it was very insightful to hear directly from them, particularly those that were slightly older reflecting back on those late primary school, early high school years and the sorts of challenges they faced with, you know, kids in year five and six. It wasn't about sex, but it was definitely about touch and intimacy and, and how to resist or communicate what your needs and wants were. I think that was one of the real highlights for me in, in writing this book, was actually hearing from, you know, from young people themselves. One of the reasons I think the collaboration between Dr Melissa and I really works is because Dr Melissa is so great at communicating health related, science related and medically tested information, both as Dolly Doctor, but also in her daily practice of medicine. And my job since I sort of started in the media has always been to find ways to communicate with people in a way that's kind of cool and approachable. So what you find in the book that I'm super proud of is the damn thing is readable. So you can write the greatest book in the world and give it to a 12 year old boy. If he doesn't read it, your time has been wasted. What we've done with Welcome to Consent is create something that they actually want to read. Look, I'll be honest, writing this book was really hard work. It was absolutely gut-wrenching at times and <laughs> probably the hardest work yeah. I've ever done. But now that it's a complete book, I couldn't be more pleased and my ambition is to get a copy into the hands of every year seven or eight schoolboy in the entire country. I think if we could do that, it would actually change an entire generation. If you have any sway in your job as a book buyer, please encourage this book to find its way onto school reading lists. Stat, it's an almost urgent health need. Yeah, I, I, I really agree with that, Yumi. I also encourage parents to read this, even if their children aren't ready for this book or their parents think it's too young. There's nothing in this book that is not actually relevant to the parents of really young children. And I think that Adults having conversations with each other, let alone their children, those adolescent children, about consent is really hard. And I, I actually think in writing the book ourselves, I think I learnt some tools myself and thought, oh, I should have done that when my children were younger. I think it's a really useful book for parents, even though it's targeting um, older children and, and teenagers. 
When Dr. Melissa and I wrote Welcome to Your Period, so many women with children said, I wish this book had been around when I was 11 or 12 years old. And I feel like the same will happen with Welcome to Consent. It's laying things out that have previously just been assumed or taboo or just unspoken. I wish this book had been around for me when I was a teenager or younger and just I wish I'd been given these tools to understand what respecting others means and respecting other people's boundaries can mean. And also, of course, how to defend my own boundaries and how to describe them to another person. If we could go back in time and give teenage us a copy of Welcome to Consent, we would be so thrilled, I think. Yeah, no, it, it's, um, it's, it's full of really relatable, real life stories. I think that's what makes it such to me a rich and delicious book because it actually as I said brings the word to life talks about all the different dimensions of consent and how to recognize what consent is and what it isn't and what to do if you're not quite sure one of the things that I really wanted to do with welcome to consent is Imagine that you're a teenage kid, right? And you are in some funny situations where there's maybe alcohol or a party that you've never kind of been to a party quite like that before. Is to put words there that you can actually have a little go, getting your mouth around saying, oh no, I don't feel like it, or that's not really my scene, or finding a way to use words to stick up for yourself that are just completely fine for a teenager to use. And a teenager loves a good example. So if you can run a bunch of examples like we do in the book, then suddenly they've got a whole toolkit that they can use. Welcome to Consent is coming out at a time when the national conversation around consent has suddenly gone from zero to a hundred. It's a lot of people have said to Dr. Melissa and I, well, that's good timing for the book, which is terrible in a way. And we've always had a sense that this book needed to be written urgently, but now at least the idea that a book about consent is incredibly useful has hit the mainstream. Hi everyone, I'm Luna. I'm a senior editor at Hardy Grant Children's Publishing and I am super excited to introduce you all to Tim Tomorrow and the Subterranean Heartsick Blues, which is a very funny and very sexy own voices LGBTQ novel written for young adults. It is set in a magical boarding school which is beneath a glacier in New Zealand. So the setting itself is freezing cold and the book itself is totally hot. You're all going to love it. Um, it's about Tim Tomorrow and his nemesis, Elliot Parker. They've never gotten on, but in their final year of high school, they decide to team up to do the school's annual egg baby assignment as a way of getting back at their exes, who've dumped them pretty much right before the assignment is due to begin. What this means is that they're the parents of a magically enchanted egg and that also means that they spend a lot of time together. And the more time they spend together, the more they realise they actually might not hate each other and might be physically attracted to each other and, well, I mean, Tim's been feeling a bit bi-curious lately and it turns out Elliot is quite happy to indulge and so they come to an arrangement just for the duration of the assignment with no strings attached. What could possibly go wrong? Well, neither of them have counted on their feelings getting in the way. What happens next is an absolutely glorious read. It is full of love and lust and of course magic, but it also has some really fantastic twists and turns that you absolutely won't see coming. Um, it's no wonder that this was a manuscript that blew us all away when we read it as an entry for our ampersand prize last year. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Ampersand Prize is our um, award for debut writers in Australia and New Zealand. We love this book so much that we can't wait to see it in the hands of readers everywhere, so we're actually rushing it to press and it will be available for you in August. It is perfect for fans of Rainbow Rowell and Red, White and Royal Blue and it's also re got really great crossover appeal. So it will appeal to any grown-up fans of Harry Potter, which is kind of everyone. It's a really good book to snuggle up with in winter and it's also a really good book to take to the beach in summer. So it's a winner all around. 
I had the really immense privilege of working with the incredibly talented author on this book and now it's my pleasure to introduce you to her. Her name is H.S. Valley. She is a New Zealand author and I really hope she keeps writing for many years to come so that I can keep working with her and reading all of her books. Congratulations on winning the prize, H.S. Um, over to you. Hello, I am Helen. I write as H.S. Valley. Uh, that's not my real name. I am a school teacher, which is why that's not my real name. Um, my inspiration for this book, it was it was based on a piece of fan fiction, if I'm going to be totally honest. Fan fiction I wrote. The challenge was to write the quintessential high school fic and, and nailed it, I think. <laughs> um, there is enemies to lovers. There is some forced proximity when our, our two main characters, who've hated each other forever, uh, have to work together on a school assignment, uh, raising an egg baby, which is magical because they're at a magical boarding school. Uh, there's bed sharing, there is pining, poor Tim. Uh, there are magical mishaps that um, are awesome. And a few competence bonus here and there. There are a woman being awesome and giving out great advice, and there are guy friends also being awesome and giving out hugs. The ampersand prize uh, was a little bit of a surprise. I found the information about it five weeks before it was due. I didn't expect to be shortlisted. I wanted to be shortlisted. Uh, when I was shortlisted, I did not expect to win. The book's kind of about forgiveness, about forgiving other people, and forgiving yourself for liking them. <laughs> um, there is definitely a lot in there about consent because consent is very important uh, for teenagers and for grown-ups. Uh, there's a lot of mental health, uh, good representation, yay, seeing counsellors and, and all that jazz. Um, overall though, it's, it's kind of about making your own choices about your sexuality and what you do with it and how to make healthy choices about that that are careful and well informed because these are important things. Hello, <laughs> I'm Penny. I'm the publishing manager at Heidi Grant Children's Publishing and I'm here to tell you all about Barclay Mansion, which um, if you know me at all, it's that I love making books and I love dogs. And so you can imagine my delight when I got to combine these two things into the one project. So we've got a brand new junior fiction series um, called Barclay Mansion coming from Melissa Keel and Adele Thomas. So Barclay Mansion um, is a house on Sullivan Street that contains four dogs who've been living there for a long time and they have a new arrival, a gorilla named Edmund and it is full of various characters um, living next door. We've got the evil bunnies, we've got the uh, chameleon that lives in the tree and we have Maury the fish who's probably my favourite. So Barkley Mansion is perfect for fans of real pigeons and bad guys. It has three separate stories that are all interlinked but can be read separately and it is full of the hectic humour that these kids love um, plus it's cute to boot. So we were absolutely delighted when Melissa bought us this story and we have been fans of her for a long time, having published her um, young adult stories. She is best-selling, award-winning and she's absolutely let her comedic timing fly with this new series and we were so pleased to pair her with Adele Thomas, who you'll all be aware of from Pearl fame. It is funny, silly and They've come together in such a beautiful way. Every editorial workshop we have starts with everyone's dogs up on screen saying hello. So it's been a true delight. We're so excited for this partnership to take over the world. Barclay Mansion will be romping into stores in September 21. Plus we've got two more books following up in 2022. This series has all the warmth of Paddington Bear plus the situational comedy of Parks and Recreation. If you've ever wondered what the best name for an evil rabbit is, it's Leggy Bruce. And if you've ever wondered how many types of ham a house of dogs have in the fridge, it's 35. Find out all the answers to all the questions you didn't know you had um, in Buckley Mansion. Um, thanks, Penn. Um, I'm Melissa Keel. I am the author of Barclay Mansion. Um, Barclay Mansion is a story about a group of friends, Kyle, Cookie, Fizzy and Lady Delilah, who live in a house and they have lived together for a very long time. And it's a story about what happens to them when someone brand new, uh, a stranger, comes to live with them who is a slightly weird stranger. Uh, now Kyle, Cookie, Fizzy and Lady Delilah are all dogs and the stranger who comes to live with them is named Edmund and Edmund is a, they don't know what he is, but he is a gorilla.
The inspiration for this book, when I came to write something that I wanted to write a junior series, um, it really was sitcoms. Um, I love sitcoms. I like those sort of half hour comedies, the kind of episodic, um, fun, quirky, weird shows about groups of, um, about a kind of cool, fun, quirky cast of characters. And that's what I wanted to write in this book. Um, so it is very episodic. There's three stories in each book and each story is about the kind of hijinks and shenanigans that these these four kind of dogs get up to who um, have you know always the best of intentions but aren't the most sensible uh, group of little creatures and often get up to uh, a lot of scrapes uh, their best laid plans immediately go awry and Edmund is the kind of voice of reason and kind of sensible um, a, a sensible person who, or sensible gorilla I should say, sensible character who kind of steps in and often has to shepherd them through their, um, their kind of wild and, and, and wacky adventures. It's definitely been a big challenge, a really exciting challenge, but a big difference from writing YA. Um, it's still very character based, which I think is my favorite thing about writing young adult books. I love characters. I love creating characters and kind of fleshing them out and, and making this sort of cast of really wonderful people. Um, and so I really wanted to do the same thing with these cast of really great dogs who I love dearly and Edmund, who I also love. Um, but it was a big challenge to try and um, create rounded, funny um, characters with a history and with personality in, you know, 25 words or less per page. So that was, the, I think that was a big challenge, but one that was a lot of fun. Um, and working with Adele, working with an illustrator and a collaborator, um, of course, books are always collaborative, young adult novels, I work with an editorial team, but working with someone who really has to take half the story and to create half of that narrative um, has been amazingly fun. Um, Adele and I have had some really great, um, very long and intense and involved conversations about how the books and the characters and the world is going to work. Um, we've had lots of back and forth where I've given her ideas and she's given me ideas and the world sort of come together with the two of us sort of contributing, which has been um, really kind of amazing. And it's quite um, wonderful to have someone else to, to kind of, I guess, fill in the gaps that you have. You know, if there's, a, if there's an idea that you have that you're not quite sure how to make work, to have someone be able to kind of sketch out, oh, well, let's try this or let's try that has been really great. So I'm very excited for everyone to see the kind of final results of, of this book because I think it's going to be it's super cute, but I think it's also going to be a lot of fun. I'm very pleased to be introducing Megan Hess to the group tonight. Megan's Clarice, The Chicest Mouse in Paris books are beloved by families across the globe and we've had an even bigger year than ever before with Holiday Heist selling out and the world of Clarice now expanding. Here to tell you more about the books that will be introduced to Clarice's world is Megan herself. Hi everyone, it's Megan Hess and I am so excited today to talk about all the really exciting things that are coming up with Claris, and I should say the world of Claris. Uh, and then within that world, we have actually today, the day that I'm recording this, we have the release of my frogs, Ta -ta -ta! Ollie and Basil. Oh my God, I'm so excited about these frogs. They're out today and, um, and this is the first spin-off in the world of Claris. So stay tuned because other little um, characters that you see in the background will be making an appearance in the future. Can't, can't give anything away. But the frogs have been from day one, even though we didn't have a backstory written, I knew that one day we would explain how they turned up in the balloon in that very first story. So I'm really hoping that this one is one that boys can really get into as well. And it's for boys and girls. But this story of, of, of well, their own story and then how that connects to the rest of the world and the other characters is going to be really exciting. So I hope people love this book. So that's out today. Um, the next thing that will come out this year in the program is Clarice's next Look and Find book, which I am super excited about as well. And as I've said in the past, I loved Look and Find books as a kid. 
loved them. My my kids love them too. So this one, and this is like a proof. I don't have the actual book cover, but this is a proof just to show you the sparkle never ends. Clarice's world always has a, a bit of sparkle, a bit of foil. This one's set in New York and it kind of, we've just had the holiday heist in New York. So I think there was such a great vibe and mood for a New York adventure. So this one's a day in New York and she does all everything. Broadway, Central Park, brunch at Bergdorf's. It's fabulous. It's incredible. So this, this is going to be really fun and this will be out um, mid-year. Super fun. Um, and then next in the program, we have a really exciting new spin-off program where we're going to do a Claris activity book. And we've been doing on the site, on the website uh, with Hardy Grant, lots of different activities during, since she's been released. And we've had lots of engagement with that and people really loving that. And again, I was a coloring in kid. I loved it, activities and puzzles. So we are working right now on a really fun Create with Clara's book, which will be coloring in, which will be puzzles, word searches, and they're kind of all in a theme base relate back to the previous storybooks. So that's going to be very cool. Also, we have a diary. Dear Clarice, this diary is going to be really, really cute. Um, again, I love diaries too. This is something that kids can actually use and follow each day of the week, but they can also um, have fun little areas to write down their favorite things. Little, little surprises will be throughout the diary. And I think it'll be a really um, a really cute way to also celebrate some really fun times during the year. World Pancake Day, Cheese International Cheese Day, that's a must, um, Macaron Day. So the, the diary is going to be very cute. We're working on that. And we're also working on a wrapping paper book. Hardy Grant has a very popular series where um, the whole book is actual beautiful wrapping paper that you can rip out and actually use. I'm going to be doing a wrapping paper book with my uh, fashion illustrations and with Claris. So it's going to be kind of like a mixture of the two, but it's then definitely something that you can use and keep at home. And when you have got a gift to wrap, you can actually use one of the wrapping papers. So that's going to be a really beautiful book. And then, God, that's quite a bit. But then it doesn't end. We have got at the end of the year, Claris's fifth picture book. And I'm literally working on it right now. Um, and this one is set in a palace in France and Clarice has an amazing adventure, meets a very adorable new friend who has a couple of fears and Clarice kind of helps her with them. And it's set amongst a Versailles backdrop. There is uh, three-story cakes, there's ornate rooms, think uh, Marie Antoinette. It's, this is probably my most, absolutely my most detailed book that I've ever illustrated. Just because nothing about it is minimal. It's all max, it's all um, ornate and flowers. And this is gonna be a really beautiful book. And I think the story behind this book is, will hopefully be um, very heartwarming, will be funny as well, but it will be something that kids will really relate to when you're growing up and the little things when you're small that really kind of scare you that um, that don't need to be big fears at all. So that's that's Clarice for the year. So she's got a lot of exciting things happening. We have um, lots of exciting things happening with her, even outside of publishing that we can't announce yet, but, uh, but are in the works. So I hope that you will continue to love her journey and all the exciting things that she will unveil this year. Thank you. Bye. Hi, Anna Beavis, and we have a new book by Nick Bland coming out in November called Walk of the Whales. And it's a beautiful and incredibly clever book about the idea of the whales all walking out of the ocean in protest of humans polluting their home ground, the ocean. It's just as beautiful as Wolfred, and I'm sure you're gonna love this. We have an exciting new book called Flocked by Tren Bing and Andrew Joyner. And it's about a little sheep that dares to be different to the rest of the flock. And it's due out in October. 
Um, I am delighted to introduce you to Fifi Box, um, the hilarious and straight talking radio host, TV presenter, and um, legendary contestant on Dancing with the Stars. Um, Fifi is adding a feather to her cap in October this year with the debut release of her first picture book, Minty May Grey and the Strangely Good Day, which is all about um, self-confidence and self-love and finding beauty in the little things um, that make us unique. So the story is about Minty May Grey, who is bullied at school for the way she looks. And um, she comes home and her favorite drawing, which is a pink unicorn, polka dotted pink unicorn, um, comes to life and takes her on a whirlwind trip around um, through art history. And um, yeah, he, the unicorn shows Minty that there's more to beauty than just looking like everyone else. So I'm sure some of you know Fifi from her um, popular Instagram account and you'll know that she's really passionate about um, portraying real life with all its potholes and difficulties and um, this really extends to challenging body and beauty standards and so I feel that Minty was always inside Fifi. Uh, that's definitely how it felt when we were working together. Um, the writing just flowed and her, her rhyme is just genius and um, yeah she, she just had a real passion for delivering the right message to, to the young audience. Um, so we've partnered Fifi up with Frida Chu, who is an up-and-coming illustrator who we're really excited about and it's just been a dream team. She's the perfect person to bring this story to life. Her, her characters are so lovable and um, just a little bit quirky. They all have a bit of a glint in their eye, um, so they just make the perfect team. Minty May Grey and the Strangely Good Day is publishing in October 2021. Thank you, wonderful booksellers. I'm sure you'll agree that this is our best list ever. We look forward to seeing these books sell and enjoying wonderful success with you all throughout 2021.